It has begun. Hey all and welcome to my Mortal Kombat Iceberg Explained. Before we jump in, I just want to call out the Mortal Kombat 1 life gauge, which you will see appear at the bottom left corner of the video. Full health means full confidence on the matter which we are discussing, while anything less equates to some measure in lack of confidence. Alright, with that said, let's jump right in. While a sequel tentatively dubbed Mortal Kombat Devastation was definitely planned, Poor critic reception of Annihilation and development hell leading all the way into as late as 2006 would ensure the film would never see the light of day. Though, over the years, tidbits have surfaced speaking to the plans and legitimacy of the film. Here's an excerpt from an interview with Lyndon Ashby. Yeah. And you know what? She was right, because I hear Johnny Cage might be coming back from Johnny, Mortal Kombat 3, Johnny huh? Johnny Cage, Mortal Kombat 3, they're in um, sort of legal yeah, yeah. negotiations and roundabouts. But yeah, I've read the script, it's good. How yeah, great. Johnny Cage is back. And here is some unreleased promotional art and studio photos of Quan Chi, which were never meant to see the light of day, I'm sure. There is a focal minority who believe the woman in Jade's MK9 ending might be Kronika, Cetrion, or possibly Delia. However, NetherRealm Studios have confirmed that the woman in Jade's MK9 ending is her own mother. This is less dramatic, though it does leave the door wide open for future sequels. I mean, she clearly does have some mystical powers the way they're described in the MK9 ending, so this could eventually become something really cool. This one, as you might guess, is not a very sophisticated theory, beyond the fact that Frost, Bihan, and Kwai Liang are the last living cryomancers. You could argue that if they share a lineage, then it's a likely possibility that they also share blood. You could also argue that Frost and Kwai Liang have always been at odds with each other in terms of ideals, almost in a sibling rivalry type of way. Kwai Liang is the Grandmaster of the Lin Kuei and pretty humble about it, while Frost lusts for this power and wishes to someday overthrow her clan. And did I mention that in Mortal Kombat 11, she says that she killed her mother at age 12? Why only cyberize your arms? Mama always preached moderation. I killed my mother when I was 12. Perhaps Netherrealm has intentionally kept the door open on a family reveal someday. I mean, we've almost seen it all when it comes to plotlines in Mortal Kombat. They could totally have something like this tucked in their back pocket for a future sequel. Toasty refers to the pan-in of sound composer of the original game, Stan Forden, at random intervals when the player executes a successful uppercut. <laughs> While you wouldn't know it unless you were there at the time, a third combat pack to an already legendary Mortal Kombat X roster was indeed planned. Not much is known on who would have been a lock to be featured, though it has been confirmed that Kai, who debuted in Mortal Kombat 4, would have made it in. Funnily enough though, Kai still has not been featured as DLC in Mortal Kombat 11, which makes you wonder there. It's my opinion that NetherRealm Studios realized that enough players are complaining about Combat League as is, and personally I think I speak for most when I say I'd rather face a Scorpion or Shiva any day over this. <laughs> This is an obvious statement for anyone who has played MKX for more than a week or two, where his alternative costume confirmed his skin tone is not green, but in fact war paint. Um, this was further confirmed in Mortal Kombat 11 in his alt skins. There is indeed a connection between Mortal Kombat and the film Bloodsport. The producers of the film Universal Soldiers approached Midway Games to create a game based on the film. Midway countered saying that they liked the idea, but preferred to make it blood violent to stay true to the film. The deal didn't work out due to this creative difference, and the Hollywood martial arts fighter would be dubbed as our beloved Johnny Cage. Data miners had discovered internal data hinting at the arrival of Ash Williams from Evil Dead within Mortal Kombat 11's Aftermath patch. Additionally, there was a newsletter that went out that made mention of Army of Darkness in the copyright section. Both of these mediums were immediately erased and dismissed by NetherRealm. MK11 has gone through two combat packs, and obviously Ash still hasn't managed to materialize despite all of this. So it's a messy situation to say the least, where it's possible the publisher who owns the rights to Ash Williams may have backed out at the 11th hour, possibly due to some concern, or disapproval on how NetherRealm fleshed out their IP in MK11, or some other reason. There is probably at least one more combat pack remaining, so I guess the jury is still out on his pending addition to the roster. 
So this is a lesser known fact, and especially to newer fans. On the original console release ports of Mortal Kombat 1, including the Sega Genesis, blood effects were disabled. Players eventually discovered you could enter a unique button combination during a track mode. This button combination, A-B-A-C-A-B-B, -B -B, is also a reference to an album by the rock band Genesis. So you could interpret this code as a pun, being possible on a console which shares its name with the band. Once the code is entered correctly, a GET OVER HERE can be heard as confirmation that it worked. So I will refer to Torch as Blaze. Torch basically came from back in the day when Midway wanted to name him Torch, but couldn't due to Marvel owning the IP to Human Torch. Hornbuckle and Blaze are the two characters seen fighting in the background of the Pit 2 level. Hornbuckle could be referred to as a clue by Jade before a fight, who is effectively a Liu Kang palette swap, while Blaze would eventually become playable in Deadly Alliance, then eventually appeared again as the final boss in Mortal Kombat Armageddon. Hornbuckle unfortunately never became playable, however this did not stop fans from putting him in the game and for some reason made his fireball have no recovery frame. <laughs> There's something fantastic about the creative decision to give him an unlimited fireball that's just great. It's equally as ridiculous as the idea of Hornbuckle being a playable character in the first place, so in my opinion it just works. So most people believe that Reptile was introduced to the series in Mortal Kombat 2, but actually in a later revision of Mortal Kombat 1, they actually did incorporate Reptile into the game. He didn't have his own moveset, borrowing special moves from Scorpion and Sub-Zero, and you couldn't play as him unless using a cheating device, but you did have the ability to challenge him. The requirements to challenge him were a bit tough, where Player 1 had to win the 6th round without blocking, double flawless, and executing a fatality. It's asking a lot only to challenge him without unlocking him as a playable character, but for the standards at the time, it was more than enough. Reptile was a very, very important character in my opinion, since he was sort of the precursor to all of the speculation, gossip, and rumors that makes Mortal Kombat so much fun to us. It's for this reason that I hope that he eventually returns in a combat pack for Mortal Kombat 11. So if you were like most kids in the 90s, you owned a copy of Mortal Kombat Trilogy, and depending on which copy you owned, you had the ability to play as the male or female ninja known as Chameleon. While this character only appeared in Trilogy in 1996, the character eventually was revived 10 years later in Mortal Kombat Armageddon. Featured in the Mortal Kombat kit, a promotional box of goodies including temporary tattoos, stickers, and other collectible items were trading cards, which featured an image of NES gameplay on one side and a character bio on the other. Listed on the back of Johnny Cage's card made mention of a divorced wife named Cindy Ford, which was a play on Cindy Crawford. While most would assume something like this would be retconned out of the series, at least the partial existence of more than one ex-wife, including Sonya, is alluded to in Mortal Kombat 11. There is dialogue in the game where Johnny mentions making alimony payments to an ex-wife. Furthermore, in an intro fight scene of Cage and Sonya's, he says the following to Sonya. We're not a thing, Cage. Someday you'll be my favorite ex-wife. Can you hear yourself talk? The whereabouts and any information on Cindy Ford or other ex-wives still remains a mystery in the Mortal Kombat universe, per its inclusion on this iceberg. Um, this one's very similar to rumors of Reptile, Ermac, Shao Kahn, etc. also being playable. However, rumors such as this might explain why they made Goro playable in future titles, including Mortal Kombat Trilogy, Mortal Kombat Armageddon, and Mortal Kombat X. Just a bit of background since some may not know, but Jared was King of Edenia and husband and father to Sindel and Kitana respectively. This is shown in Ermac's MK9 ending. There is a minor scene in the game's story mode where Shao Kahn reveals to Kitana that he murdered him. This is sort of retconned in the NRS timeline where, while Shao Kahn was present during his death, it was in fact his evil wife Sindel who stabbed him to death in his sleep. I'm not sure why this warrants a place on the iceberg, since it is clearly demonstrated in Sindel's latter ending, along with the cutscene in Aftermath. Also, I do want to reflect on the fact that literally every single time this guy is mentioned in Mortal Kombat lore, he's being killed. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Every night, I can feel my leg and my arm, even my fingers. The body I've lost. And it's, it's really outplayed especially for someone who supposedly was king of Edenia. I mean, come on. Sonya's partner's death is attributed in the story as the reason why she hates Kano. Your mission has been to hunt down your mortal enemy, Kano, the murderer of your partner. Depending on the source material, 
the individual differs. In the Malibu comic, for example, he is named Sparky, who has the ability to spread his arms, which were also made of metal. The latter feature, of course, belonging to Jax Briggs after Mortal Kombat 2. This one could be referring to the demons who occasionally appear when using Kenshi's blindfold in the Mortal Kombat 11 crypt, but I think it's referring to the image of a creature that pops up from the bottom of the screen in Mortal Kombat 9's crypt. This creature has a true name, the Flesh Pits Mutant. It was created by Shang Tsung to guard the souls in the crypt, and is a failed, rejected Flesh Pits experiment. The Crypt Monster can be found in the Flesh Pits on the far left side. It appears to be the first version of Molina created by Shang Tsung, which would mean it is most likely female. The render is further proof of this, given its woman-like build. It is also referred to as Clone A in the in-game files. It also appears to be a Tarkata, and I feel like if you ask me, the proof is in the pudding, and this is definitely a failed clone of Molina, which is just creepy. Did you tell Jade about us? There's nothing to tell, Devor. Such deception, Koda. Did you tell Jade about us? There's nothing to tell, Devor. Such deception, Koda. So yeah, this one doesn't conjure up great thoughts. Um... It's my opinion that Devora sort of just says things sometimes where I think she's stirring up her opponent and it isn't exactly true. Similar to what she says to Katana about killing her father when we have seen in the arcade ladder of Sindel's ending that it was in fact Sindel who killed Jared and not some order that Shao Kahn gave Devora. Jared was soft and weak will. You claim to know my father? This one killed him for Shao Kahn. So yeah, this could just be a tactic to rile up Kotal and make him go off his game while they're engaging in combat. I don't know. Um, it could also be conjecture, and I simply don't want to imagine that this actually happened, but yep. So I don't think this one was a mistake, despite the fact that this snippet was cut in ports after the initial arcade and Nintendo 64 releases. And can be heard at the conclusion of Sub-Zero's Mortal Kombat 4 ending cutscene. It's not clear whose voice is in the recording, but my best guess would be Dan Forden, given his similar inclusion in other ways in the game. If I had to guess why it's there, I'd assume the team is making fun of the fact that these sworn enemies can squash their beef this easily, along with the fact that Quan Chi just exploded into a million pieces, and then within 10 seconds of that, Scorpion's like, alright dude, we can quit fighting. Forever. Dullard refers to a secret cheat menu in Mortal Kombat 1 where you could toggle the parameters of certain in-game features. There were certain flags where you could edit the frequency of Reptile appearing before your fight with his hidden messages, or affecting the object that flies by on the pit stage, which may include a kite or Santa and his reindeer. This bit on the iceberg refers to the amount of characters who have murdered Johnny Cage at least once in the MK series. I could do a deep dive into each character and their ways of killing him, and how relevant it is to the newest timeline, but I will defer you to Tabmok 99s analysis on the subject. He does a wonderful job tackling this one. Link is down below. In the netherrealm of Mortal Kombat Deception's conquest mode, NPCs in the area speak with a warped tone of speech to reflect their tainted spirit. Unbeknownst to most, this is nothing more than a reverse speech effect. The content of the reverse speech ranges everywhere to essential to the game's overarching plot, hints on how to obtain hidden rewards, also includes inside jokes among Midway game staff and plenty more. Onaga took possession of Reptile's body in Outworld before stealing the Kamidogo and claiming Quan Chi's amulet for himself. Mortal Kombat. Toasty. Frosty. Finish him. Fatality. Flawless victory. I alluded to the Malibu comics earlier when briefly mentioning one of Sonya's partners who was killed by Kano. These comics are chock full of fun facts and weird interactions between the Mortal Kombat characters, one of which includes Sonya meeting an Outworld native who went by the name Anos, or Sonya spelled backwards. Anos appeared briefly in the comic, and her identical features to Sonya were never really explained. While she hasn't been mentioned since, it is something that I wouldn't mind seeing NRS explore in the future. Similar to most characters that came into fruition in the Mortal Kombat universe, Scarlet was born from a rumor that a red katana was playable in Mortal Kombat 2.
Scarlet would finally be realized as a playable character 18 years later as DLC in Mortal Kombat 9. The Lords of Acid are a music group who composed the soundtrack for the 1995 Mortal Kombat film. For this project, they actually are credited under a different name, The Immortals. There was a rumor back in the day in the arcade era of Mortal Kombat where there was a hidden stage fatality possible on the Living Forest stage, similar to the classic stage fatality possible on The Pit. Though this was only bred from fans' imagination at the time, the Mortal Kombat devs made this dream actualized in Mortal Kombat 9. Flawless victory. Fatality. Kratos and Freddy Krueger were the guest characters who appeared in Mortal Kombat 9. Besides their names both beginning with the letter K, plus both being the only guest characters in the game, I couldn't really find a deeper connection that warrants this bit on the iceberg. Perhaps there is something deeper to it, so please say something in the comments section if I'm missing something here. After completing 250 games against a human opponent, Pong is playable in Mortal Kombat 2. Once a player reaches a tally of 7, the combat resumes. This trend actually continued in Mortal Kombat 3 where, if the player executes the correct code on the versus screen, you could actually play Galaga. Red Robin refers to a red palette swap of Scorpion who was rumored to be playable in Mortal Kombat 2. A gaming magazine basically made very brief mention of him in a clearly faked fashion and the internet took this and ran with it. However, unlike other rumored characters, the devs never even remotely mentioned Red Robin in the game's universe. This might be due to the influx of ninjas that came into fruition in Mortal Kombat 2's sequel, Mortal Kombat Trilogy. Belloc was a character who was developed for Mortal Kombat Gold, but was eventually scrapped due to time constraints. Many years after Mortal Kombat Gold was released, the company responsible for Mortal Kombat Gold's development, Eurocom, accidentally leaked information on Belloc, including these six gameplay photos. Also worthy to note is that weird glitch that doesn't seem to do anything in Tanya's character portrait in this game, involving the question mark which may infer it was for an unlockable character. Given the screenshots of how close Belloc was to being playable in the final builds, it wouldn't be a stretch to put two and two together here. The murderer of Su Hao is a bit less complicated than Johnny's murderer as you might guess, but nonetheless not simple either. Initially, Su Hao is murdered by Jax in Deadly Alliance. However, he mysteriously returns without any mention made of how he became resurrected in Armageddon. Now, within the NRS timeline, there was an MKX comic where Scorpion is depicted having killed Su Hao. However, in Mortal Kombat 11, his decapitated head is featured in one of Aaron Black's opening fighting sequences. Now, I could go and make another Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain meme on how pathetic Su Hao is. Unfortunately, due to this character being in the same category as Cobra in terms of their footprint in the Mortal Kombat universe, I don't think this question will become any more interesting before the heat deaths of the universe. This is one that I can remember thinking about as a kid. While this never became actualized whatsoever in later games, there are rumors which claim that this was John Tobias' vision for Raikou, but was eventually canned. Funnily enough, the buzz from fans on Raikou being Shao Kahn is debunked in Mortal Kombat Deception's Conquest mode if you reverse certain NPCs' speech. Raikou is not Shao Kahn, though sometimes he secretly wears the Emperor's helmet. The following is depicted in Melina's MKX ladder ending. After defeating Chinook, Melina awakens in the same Flesh Pit's incubation chamber in which she and her failed clones were being created. They realize they possess the ability of telepathy with one another, and aspire to conquer together. At the end of the scene, it's vaguely mentioned that some hidden force is puppeteering the strings on making this all happen. My best bet would be Shang Tsung. Unfortunately, this story was never fleshed out in Eleven. However, it's not like this ending was canon in the first place. Crypt screams of real people can be heard throughout most iterations of the crypt across a broad range of FK titles. It has been rumored that certain screams are taken from candid moments of real violence and horror inflicted on innocent people. Along with being the name of one of the OST tracks in Mortal Kombat 4, Meat refers to the hidden playable character featured in the game. Though he didn't have an established story initially, similar to Jade and Reptile, and others' first inclusion in the series, the Mortal Kombat developers eventually decided to include him as a playable character in Armageddon, where he had his own unique story ending. Panther is a hybrid half-panther, half-human Mugen character. Its hitboxes and damage output are absurd. 
It's a pure fan-created character who was never mentioned or rumored to belong in any Mortal Kombat game. Pretty sure this part of the iceberg referring to a canon in the MK series is just a joke. Chinook remembering Armageddon could be explained in Chinook's Armageddon Ladder Ending, where it is said that Chinook merely sent a clone of himself to pose as the real Chinook, while the real Chinook watched from afar on the events of Armageddon as they played out. Over the course of the MK9 story, which is a retelling of the first three Mortal Kombat tournaments, Raiden is under the impression that the He Must Win message refers to Liu Kang. Eventually at the end of the game, it's shown that He Must Win actually referred to Shao Kahn. This is proven at the end of the story where, once Shao Kahn defeats Liu Kang and Raiden, the other gods intervene by resuscitating Raiden and granting him the strength needed to defeat Shao Kahn. The other gods did this due to Shao Kahn breaking the rules of merging the realms prematurely. However, this does bring us to the Iceberg's interpretation of the ending. This theory suggests that it was in fact Liu Kang who Raiden was referring to in his He Must Win message. If Liu Kang were to defeat Shao Kahn, it may easily not have costed his life on top of leading to the devastating events, which would follow in Deadly Alliance and Deception. Of course, a naked Sonya code never existed in a Mortal Kombat game, though it is rumored that you can insert a special code in your search engine of choice in order to achieve this outcome. Much to the chagrin of diehard Mortal Kombat fans, many finishers in Mortal Kombat vs DC were censored or outright weak due to the teen ESRB rating. Joker's fatality was among them, using a pistol to execute his opponent off screen. Taking feedback from their fans, Netherrealm ensured the fatality would be tweaked properly to suit an MK game the first chance it could get in Mortal Kombat 9. Shang Tsung morphs into the Joker, who pulls off the same fatality, but this time fully on screen. There is an audit option within the debug menu in Mortal Kombat 2 which calls out the number of times Kano transformations occur in the game. After this caused some rumors of Kano being playable in Mortal Kombat 2, or possibly having the hidden ability to transform, the devs made light of this incident in Nightwolf's friendship in Mortal Kombat Trilogy. Nightwolf wins. Nightwolf wins. Friendship. Friendship? Again? While I understand that this was the initial plot of Mortal Kombat 9, where Liu Kang was constantly questioning Raiden's decision making, plus MK Legacy had that thing where Raiden was receiving lobotomy treatment in the hospital, do I honestly think the Sunder God is a candidate for dementia? I don't think so. <laughs> Shao Kahn's soul existing within Ermac is constantly alluded to in many of Ermac's MKX fight intro dialogues. Ermac. Feel the wrath of also, on a personal note, this adds to my headcanon as a kid when I was always wondering why Ermac had the same special move projectile as Shao Kahn in Mortal Kombat Trilogy. This one is unfortunately true. The characters planned for DLC in Mortal Kombat vs DC included the likes of Quan Chi, Johnny Cage, Harley Quinn, and Nightwing. It didn't work out and support of the game's post-launch development came to an abrupt halt as Midway was going through bankruptcy. Personally, I was never a big fan of this game. While I think crossovers are great, the teen ESRB rating made this game feel weird and poorly thought out. This take only becomes more and more true with each installment of Mortal Kombat since, where the blood and violence only gets progressively more impressive. I couldn't find any real tangible proof on this on the internet, but many believe that it's mentioned in Deadly Alliance that Johnny was featured in an episode of Celebrity Smash TV. To what extent this was fleshed out or shown, I'm not sure. If I had to wager a guess on a good place to start in looking for this, I'd bet it's mentioned in a story concept reward buried somewhere in the game's crypt. If you know any differently, please let me know in the comments. The One Being is described in Mortal Kombat lore as a progenitor of the realms, who existed at the beginning of time before there were Elder Gods. While very very little is known about the One Being, there is a hidden message in Deception's Conquest mode which aptly spells out this entry on the iceberg. All of existence is merely the dreams of the One Being. Today, we know there are technically two Sub-Zeros, one being the original Sub-Zero, first named Bihan, who is the Sub-Zero who appears in Mortal Kombat 1, Mortal Kombat Mythologies, and the beginning of Mortal Kombat 9 story. Kwai Liang is the younger brother who took over in Mortal Kombat 2 and onwards. This part of the iceberg alluding to a third brother could be referring to Mortal Kombat Trilogy where technically three Sub-Zeros exist, with the Max Sub-Zero, the Unmaxed Sub-Zero, and Noob Saibot. 
However, it is important to note that Noob Saibot was initially a Joe character who had no established lore at the time, let alone as the original Sub-Zero. So in fact, there have only ever been two Sub-Zeros, and the reason for three existing in this game is due to the Noob Saibot being Sub-Zero retcon not coming into fruition until it was revealed in Noob Smoke's Mortal Kombat Deception latter ending. Also, they gave Noob Scorpion Spear in the Deadly Alliance port on the Game Boy Advance, which tells you all you need to know about the Sub-Zero retcon not coming until several years after Trilogy. In 2017, Ed Boon made a tweet which confirmed that Raiden was initially the only playable character during the initial phase of development on the Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks project. Pedro was a fake character rumored to be playable in Mortal Kombat 3. His origin is North Mexico. <laughs> where he was a leader of a narcotic control brigade. A palette swap of Striker, this character is most definitely fake and just fan art. Though he has found his way in <laughs> Though he has found his way into Mugen games, similar to the Shatter Priest. Pretty sure the playable Shatter Priest was just a rumor invented by kids who played the games and thought they looked cool in the background and thus began speculating on how to use them, what their moveset must be like, etc. Not exactly sure what this is meant to refer to on the iceberg, Fire and Ice was the working title to Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monk sequel in development, starring Scorpion and Sub-Zero working together in a similar vein to Liu Kang and Kung Lao. Much time has passed since Shaolin Monks where Scorpion and Sub-Zero have appeared more often than not lately as allies. This may be what this bit on the iceberg is referring to in terms of story canon, where the story of Mortal Kombat Fire and Ice was sort of ahead of its time, and this would sort of be actualized later on in the Netherrealm Studios timeline in Mortal Kombat 11. Serena being cut from the fifth installment of the Mortal Kombat series makes a ton of sense, considering the port on the Game Boy Advance Mortal Kombat Tournament Edition did feature her, Sector, and Noob Saibot as playable characters. There is a glitch in the SNES version of Mortal Kombat 1 where a silver Goro appears if you execute a fatality during the second endurance match. Nothing more than a bizarre development oversight, but still very cool and curious nonetheless. Wu Lei Immortality refers to the moment in Armageddon's Conquest mode where you run into Wu Lei. Wu Lei is an opponent who belongs to the Tengu clan, a rival clan to the Lin Kuei. Once Tavon murders Wu Lei's clan, Wu Lei begs for mercy which Tavon grants him. However, after the cutscene ends, you can commit a fatality on Wu Lei in order to be rewarded with Katana's alternate costume. Despite this, Wu Lei technically was spared in the cutscene, so it's inferred that using a fatality on him is irrelevant, and canonically, he will remain alive no matter what you do during regular gameplay. My personal take here is that Wu Lei has proven to be completely irrelevant since Armageddon released and thus is not important enough to use the term immortality within the same breath as Wu Lei. Rutu is a former nemesis to Nightwolf's ancestors, who you actually have the ability to fight as Nightwolf in the Challenger Tower of Mortal Kombat 9. You face him in Jade's Desert. Although his character hasn't been fleshed out since, and his design could use a few tweaks, it would be great if this character is explored further in future MK titles. The Fourth Snake is a YouTuber who has spent the past 10 years covering Mortal Kombat. Many of his videos include hot takes on the direction the series has taken since NRS has taken control of the franchise. So in addition to his dedication and wealth of knowledge on MK, which seem to go beyond the most dedicated of fans, there's a joke among the community that he's in fact a salty ex-Midway employee. I personally don't buy this, but can't deny that it's pretty funny. There is no proof that a port like this actually existed, and it's probably rumored due to the Genesis having a blood toggle in their version of the game, on top of the bevy of actual pirated versions of original MK titles that were floating around back in the 90s. Personalized copies, if you will. If there's one character fandom which is the most dedicated, I'd argue it's Molinus. Additionally, I'd argue that if there's one individual more beloved than Ed Boon in the Mortal Kombat community, that individual is also Molina. So the theory here is that Ed Boon, being constantly bombarded with requests for Molina, deliberately made the decision as a creative director to banish Molina as playable in Mortal Kombat 11 out of jealousy. So according to Reddit user The Great Kentaro, who claims to have actually built this entire iceberg, the Saboteur is a combination of Ferator from Mortal Kombat X and Noob Saibot, 
What they have in common is that they are both partner fighters in the game. That's about all I was able to find, so if you know more about this, please share so in the comments. Chrome is a purely fan-made character, whose powers are based on liquid metal similar to T-1000 in The Terminator 2. Netherrealm Studios once made a nod to his existence via a profile card in Mortal Kombat X for April Fool's Day. I would love if Chrome became a real character, just slightly redesigned not to be a ninja. Or maybe something like Tremor's design in Mortal Kombat X. Given Mortal Kombat 1, Shang Tsung lacked his own fatality in the first game, rumors did circulate that since most characters in that game did have a fatality, that in fact, Shang Tsung did have a fatality in this game, with the frequency rate of it happening somewhere close to zero. Obviously, this wasn't true, but he would receive his own fatality as a playable character in Mortal Kombat 2, in addition to a friendship and babality. Crypt Runners refers to the character seen and heard running around in Deadly Alliance's Crypt. This one was really fun for me as a kid playing on a CRT, since it was often hard to make out which character I could catch at the corner of my eye. So the Fighter's Den is one of my favorite YouTubers, so when I came across this one on the iceberg, I definitely had a good laugh. The Fighter's Den covers Mortal Kombat content along with other fighting games, but he has been very, very outspoken on Kotal Khan being an egregious case of a jobber since his addition to the series in Mortal Kombat X. But this became even worse in Mortal Kombat 11. I'm not sure that he influenced Kotal's jobbing into the second gear in Mortal Kombat 11, but I do concur with his statement. Despite being Khan, Kotal is constantly getting his ass kicked. Onaga, or the Dragon King, is seldom referred to in Mortal Kombat Deception's prequel, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. The Dragon King is largely relevant in Reptile's latter ending, in which it's said that the Dragon King possessed Reptile to do his bidding. This one refers to the rock band responsible for the theme song of Deadly Alliance, since they happened to make a song for the Mortal Kombat universe and the year was 2002, you can put two and two together on this and figure out why fans were speculating on the rock band being playable fighters in the game. Uh, thankfully there is no merit to this. So in my research, I wasn't able to find much on Baker Liu Kang. The only thing I can imagine this may refer to is that weird glitch where his butt gets bigger <laughs> depending on which skin of his you select. I mean, this is technically real, so I'll fill this in with a full green bar. This one is definitely a joke. Speaking from Jared's point of view, he does get killed so often that he would be the type in Mortal Kombat 11 who would prefer to perform the quitality instead of getting bodied for the millionth time. Unfortunately for Jared though, he never even had the chance to take his own life. While this entry on the iceberg might make sense at a glance, when you actually look at when Tobias left Midway, which was 1999 during the development of Mortal Kombat Special Forces, the next two games to feature Noob Saibot were Mortal Kombat Gold and Mortal Kombat Tournament Edition, which each did not omit the Saibot in Noob Saibot's name. So yeah, this one is just baseless and edgy, though it would have been pretty funny if this actually happened. Super Unlockables refer to rumors of extra hidden fighters, second fatalities, new stage fatalities, and more being unlockable in Deadly Alliance's Crypt, among other Mortal Kombat games as well. Methods to go about unlocking these include ridiculous requirements, some including spelling out specific phrases by purchasing certain crypts or certain crypt coffins in a row. Unfortunately, none of these were true and simply troll attempts on sites like cheatcodes.com and wishful thinking. Virgality is a hidden fatality you can perform in the armory stage of Mortal Kombat 2 as a hidden joke, where Raiden can transform into probe limited employee Fergus McGovern. Fergus McGovern was a pioneer in game development in the 90s, and his inclusion as an easter egg here is not dissimilar to other Midway games where he is featured in fun ways. Fergus passed away 5 years ago at the age of 50, but he lives on through his work. Do you remember Reptile saying to make like a tree and leave me be during Mortal Kombat Deception's conquest mode? Me neither, but have you heard of the Mandela Effect? No, I'm not referring to the Bad Ben film. The Mandela Effect is that eerie feeling you get when you realize that not only is your recollection of some form of media untrue, such as the way Bernstein bears ought to be spelled, but also that there's a very large number of individuals who share your opinion. Reptile saying Leaf Me Be during Deception Conquest Mode is apparently considered a Mandela Effect. Personally, I can't pretend I remember this, but corny humor has never been something the MK devs steered clear from, especially in the Conquest Mode which is riddled with tons of quirky dialogue.
I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce this full name, but Aqua for short was a duck build ninja character featured in a British gaming magazine before Trilogy's release. Allegedly, there is a sound file in the game which says Aqua wins, which eventually surfaced on YouTube. Aqua wins. But if you ask me, this is someone's clever way of combining a few different sound effects into one. This effect is extremely clever, and props to the creator, but it does sound like a fusion of Baraka, Sonya, and or maybe Shiva's. Aqua is a fan favorite among the Mugen community, and it would be great if Netherrealm eventually gives him a nod. I think they may have done this in an extremely subtle way, with that one costume you can pull off with Sub-Zero where he'll wear like a yellow mask for seemingly no reason, uh, but admittedly that is a bit of a stretch. Jarek being a failed Kano clone makes a little bit of sense to me, given he does share similar moves to him but in a watered down way. Plus they are both Black Dragon and I can see some clone program going on in their sector due to their lack of ethics overall. In Raiden's friendship in Mortal Kombat 2, he summons a smaller version of himself to his right who is known as Kid Thunder. Kid Thunder has never been referred to specifically in Mortal Kombat lore. There was once a trading card for MK provided by Brady Games in 1995, which refers to Kid Thunder as Raiden's favorite nephew. But we're talking about over 25 years ago since this has been mentioned, so yeah. So not much is known about Kid Thunder lately, though he has been reintroduced in Raiden's friendship in Mortal Kombat 11. As much as I would love this one to be true, I think in a way it's fortunate since we can possibly see this partnership come into fruition later as opposed to back in the 3D era when the gameplay in Mortal Kombat games were personally my least favorite. I prefer the 2D combat similar to the direction they have taken since Mortal Kombat 9 in 2011. However, back to the topic at hand. The Iceberg claims that Cobra, bearing a striking resemblance to Ken Masters in Street Fighter, is the result of a cancelled Street Fighter crossover. While the Mortal Kombat developers did feature his name as Ken Masters as placeholder during development, there was definitely not a crossover in the works. It has been confirmed that Sonya was indeed meant to be a playable character in Mortal Kombat Special Forces, but was cut due to time constraints. Also as an interesting side note, she is referred to in the game's code as Panther. Deadly Alliance Sub-Zero has always rubbed me as his worst portrayal of all time. Well, maybe technically second to his alt costume in Deception, but he's most certainly not an imposter or anything. Just a weird design choice for Mortal Kombat 5. It is rumored that there was in fact a cut Artlene funeral scene in which Cage, Sonya, and others mourn his death. So I rewatched the Mortal Kombat movie while in the process of making this video and I have to say that this seems pretty reasonable. Art was actually featured much more prominently in this film than I recalled, and when his death occurs, it really just becomes an afterthought and isn't mentioned again in the film. While Johnny does technically avenge his death versus Goro in a later scene, on top of Liu Kang defeating Shang Tsung where Art's soul was freed, it still feels like something is missing from the final cut of the film. And although this is highly unconfirmed, I thought it also important to share this post from user Sub-0961 of the Mortal Kombat Online forum, where they allege they have the second draft of the Mortal Kombat film script. Here, the art funeral scenes lines between Raiden and Liu Kang are outlined in great detail. And if you ask me, I believe that this is likely real given the lines from Raiden and Liu Kang seem authentic to their lines in the film. Ed Boon's head is featured on one of the spikes on the pit level of the original Mortal Kombat trilogy. EGM, or Electronic Gaming Monthly, leaking the rumored character Nimbus Terrafo during MK1 development is definitely just a joke. If you look at the screenshots, you'll notice there's just no way this character was a real thing. Like look at that cartwheel kicking motion. It's hilarious but definitely can't be taken seriously as a possible leak. This one I think is just a meme on the great Kong Lao character in the series whose first moment being fleshed out in the franchise was actually in the Mortal Kombat Conquest TV series. This series was ahead of its time and I always recommend it any chance I can. So what better way than during this wasted space on the iceberg? You may recall in the opening cutscene of Deception's Conquest mode where Shujinko is in the schoolyard playing with his classmates. One of his friends imitates Shang Tsung. So I think this bit suggests that, on that fateful day, Damashi observed this moment and decided to entrust the quest for the Kamidogu on the kid who pretends to be Shang Tsung. So if he chose a kid who actually idolizes sorcerers like Shang Tsung, the timeline would be even darker given he might presumably cooperate with Onaga once he is revealed to be Damashi. 
Think about that for a second. Imagine how powerful Onaga could have been if he had Chujinko at his side with the 7 Kami Dogu, rather than resisting and ultimately defeating Onaga. A darker timeline indeed. And if Aftermath's storyline taught us anything, it's that this timeline must exist somewhere. This one technically looks like nothing more than a pure joke, but shockingly enough, Lucifer himself is referred to in Mortal Kombat Deception's Conquest Mode in the Netherrealm during certain NPCs' backward speech. Lucifer once ruled the Netherrealm until Shinnok defeated him. Shao Kahn, Lucifer, and Raiden are of the same race of beings. So yes, Lucifer actually was conquered by Shinnok, who would succeed him as ruler of the Netherrealm. The Netherrealm Hound was a demonic and bloodthirsty four-legged creature which was meant to be found in Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero, but was unfortunately cut. Concept art from John Tobias can be found on the internet. It is believed that assets of the Netherrealm Hound were eventually used for the Tigor creature, which exists in Mortal Kombat 9. Tigors can be seen laying beside Shao Kahn's throne in the game's throne room stage. It also appears in Kung Lao's Babality. During the scene where Raiden and Liu Kang are fighting due to Shinnok's amulet filling Raiden with rage, a series of visions come to him which reveal that he and Liu Kang are constantly fighting one another in a variety of different timelines, including their MK9 fight along with the fight in Armageddon. Obviously, the latter here belongs to a Midway MK title. The New Era is a planned reset of history that Kronika aspires to with her hourglass in Mortal Kombat 11. So while Liu Kang and Raiden seem to fight for no good reason, this is actually due to Kronika's puppet strings, so I do believe that this theory is an accurate one. This theory suggests that, during Deadly Alliance's opening somatic, Shao Kahn is officially killed for the first time. Prior to this, it was definitely canon that Kahn was also defeated in the second and third Mortal Kombat tournament, so not sure about this theory. If you know more about it, please let me know in the comments. I can see Nu being the shadow, and Saibot being Bihan being the case, though this has never been expressively hinted at by Netherrealm. There is concept art within Deadly Alliance's Crypt which shows a zebra type of combatant who was in development as a playable character in the game. I don't think this character, however, even remotely came close to being playable, which is alluded to in his Crypt Coffin where the developers mentioned they would never make him playable. Have you ever wondered why Reptile's character design took such a dramatic turn in the fifth installment of the series? Well, turns out that Reptile did get hand-me-down assets from a different lizard character, which was cancelled during Deadly Alliance's development, known as Timat. The extent to which Reptile received hand-me-down assets from Timat will forever be unknown, but personally I buy this theory a lot because Reptile's design has always struck me as too weird in this game, so I do feel a certain level of affirmation having learned this. Mocap's face and body are designed after Carlos Pesina, who is famous for his portrayal of Raiden in the first three Mortal Kombat games. Once again, poor Jared. Needless to say, this is highly deconfirmed in Mortal Kombat 11. It is a common fan theory which suggests that Earth and Earth Realm are two separate areas in reality. Let's look at the character Striker for example. Games where Striker is featured, the developers make a conscious effort to describe how Stryker is merely a mortal man, which uses weapons like a gun, taser, and club in order to keep up with combatants from Outworld, the Netherrealm, and Earthrealm, where warriors like Liu Kang reside. This could be chalked up as a plot hole, but given the direction the games have taken lately with X and Eleven, I think this theory is becoming less credible with each new installment. Still, it is interesting to circle back to older games and reflect on Earth being separate from Earthrealm. Couldn't find much when researching this one. Pretty sure it is simply a joke comparison that they are drawing with Netherrealm Studios. Ed Boon tweeted on May 9th, 2020 that there is an elevator in the Netherrealm Studios which takes you to somewhere which no one has had the courage to go ahead and see. I think we can rule out Hell, but technically, what is Hell? In Mortal Kombat canon, the Netherrealm is explicitly referred to as their version of Hell. So I mean, is this even 1% wrong? It's highly debatable and I'm morbidly curious on how photos have not surfaced on the web yet on what lies at the bottom of this elevator. 
So this one is practically identical to the bit we covered earlier, which claims this YouTuber is a former Midway employee. While simply another joke, I do find this one more plausible given how passionate John Tobias was about Mortal Kombat lore during his time with Midway. Even after his departure, Tobias has gone on to appear in many fan podcasts to discuss his vision for where he wanted to take the franchise, often in very specific detail. I urge you to look up some of these podcasts he's been featured in if you're into that kind of thing. A lot of scenes in mythologies do give me a vibe that it's in the same vein of an Unsolved Mysteries type of documentary, especially with the cutscenes acting leaving much to be desired. Despite this, and the fact that it's very much a unique one-off game which prioritizes storytelling over the gameplay, I don't think we can go as far as to say it is a documentary. Leave your thoughts though in the comments. There was a version of Mortal Kombat 3 in which Noob Saibot was actually a palette swap of Kano. Unfortunately in Mortal Kombat 11 however, there was no banter in Kano and his intro dialogues which harken back to the MK3 palette swap. So I don't believe this one holds any merit these days. Within the Dark Prison level in Deception, you can see Reptile wearing a mask in the vein of his original likeness, as well as a look at his Mortal Kombat 4 likeness. There are many times you see something in a game and chalk it up to lazy game design, but in this case I can't imagine they made the conscious decision to include both as an oversight. I think this was actually done on purpose to ignite speculation on these two existing simultaneously. So I'm of the mindset that one of these reptiles are the original reptile, while the other reptile is a member of reptile's original race of raptors. While I think this one on the iceberg is a similar joke to the greater Kung Lao, technically I think we can chalk up the eldest gods to the titans which were revealed to have existed before the elder gods. So far we're only aware of the one titan in Kronika, but I imagine more will be revealed in a future story expansion in Mortal Kombat 11, or possibly a sequel. So, the same actor who portrayed Johnny Cage in Mortal Kombat Rebirth and Mortal Kombat Legacy was able to land a role in a TV series named Kamen Rider Dragon Knight. I suppose the connection the iceberg is aiming to draw here is that this TV series is actually a role that Johnny Cage landed. Even though it's not really Johnny Cage, it's Matt Mullins, but yeah. Also another interesting thing I wanted to point out is that this series, Kamen Rider Dragon Knight, is pretty similar at a glance to the Power Rangers, which Ed Boon mentions Johnny Cage was a part of in Johnny Cage's episode in the Mortal Kombat Legacy series. The fans just couldn't adjust to the fact that Johnny was getting older. To them he would always be that ass kicking teen heartthrob from Power Rangers. So Deception Ninja Star's true purpose refers to an item found in Mortal Kombat Deception's Conquest mode which you can add to your inventory early on. My best guess would be given how jam packed with content Deception's Conquest mode is, the developers had the intention to include this Ninja Star in a side quest, possibly given to Raikou in return for some coins or so, but simply ran out of time. So this bit on the iceberg can be interpreted in two ways, and I'll start with the less likely interpretation. In Mortal Kombat X, when Scorpion exacts his revenge on the sorcerer, Quan Chi is whispering a spell under his breast while slowly obtaining the amulet in his possession for a brief second before Scorpion decapitates him. So Quan Chi effectively here consented to having himself killed by Scorpion due to possibly having a vision that Earthrealm warriors were going to triumph and conquer he and Chinook. So he underwent a spell which can maybe resurrect him at a later date. Okay, the second and less complicated interpretation, which I think is more to what this bit on the iceberg is referring to, is that shortly after Scorpion warps Quan Chi into the nether realm with him in Scorpion's Mortal Kombat 4 ending, you can assume that Quan Chi likely jumped into the lava and committed suicide, having been banished to the small platform with Scorpion in hell forever. Let me know if you agree with my interpretation, or have one of your own. So prior to knowing who or what the iceberg was referring to with this propagator cannon bit on the iceberg, I did take a wild guess and assume he is some Mugen character, and turns out I was correct. Propagator is a cool looking fuchsia colored cyborg in Mugen, which has the ability to attack you by hurling clones of itself at you. But similar to Pantherk, there is no cannon to this character in the official Mortal Kombat lore, sadly. MK1 was not released on the Mega Drive in Spain, given Sega's Spain division and their decision to cancel the release due to concerns on critic reception. There were many reservations on MK at the time, as it was facing a lot of negative attention by angry parents and bureaucrats. 
There are so many ports of MK1, and it's unfortunate that we never got to see the Mega Drive Spain version. So we may be left to forever wonder, was this port different from other countries' releases? Were there certain glitches impossible in other ports, similar to the Silver Goro on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System? Did they give Shang Tsung his own fatality? We unfortunately may never know. I was not able to find much on the internet which speaks to the claim that Richard DiVizio is associated with a cult, has occult connections, or which occult it is even referring to. Though there have been moments here and there in interviews with Richard where he has vaguely spoke to Midway screwing him over over something which he will reveal one day in a book. Maybe this pertains to how he was banished from working on another Mortal Kombat project again after 2002's Deadly Alliance, where he seems to have gone completely off the grid. Oh, outside of appearing in one small film after Deadly Alliance, I think it's called The Dark Knight or something. He does appear here for only one scene, but perhaps his occult connections helped him land this gig. Jokes aside, I refuse to deplete the life gauge here all the way to zero because I think this topic is one of those things which are too oddly specific for there not to be some truth to it. Something also worthy to note is the 1996 film Book of Swords, which premiered less than one year after the first Mortal Kombat film. Several characters from the Mortal Kombat video games appear here in addition to Divizio. Also, it would be remiss of me if I neglected to mention that Divizio has stated in interviews that he initially wanted the role as Kano in the first Mortal Kombat film. I would love to be able to speak to this film further, but it's actually impossible to find for purchase on the internet. Let me know in the comments if you know where I can buy it, or if I can borrow your copy so I can make a video on this whole situation later. However, to the topic at hand, in this film, his character has a fixation with the occult and black magic. So whether this film served as inspiration in Richard's personal life to dive deeper into the occult or not, I think it's a great place to start in finding out the truth on the matter. Dream Realm is referred to hardly ever, though it is technically a place mentioned in Mortal Kombat lore more recently than you might imagine. Along with it being mentioned in Freddy Krueger's Mortal Kombat 9 latter ending, it was also referenced, more substantially, in Tremor's Mortal Kombat X latter ending in which Tremor claims to have been reborn there. Eugene Gear was a visual effects artist and programmer on Mortal Kombat Mythology's Sub-Zero. In researching Eugene Gear, an obituary appears of one Eugene Gear on the Google search results front page. However, while I was trying to sort out if this was THE Eugene Gear who worked on Mortal Kombat or simply someone else, I stumbled onto Eugene's LinkedIn page where I discovered that he is still very much alive and well. He is also still involved in visual design today, currently working for Raven Software, in particular supporting games like Call of Duty. Okay, so let me preface this one by stating that if you're like me, you have absolutely no idea who Apep is. So let me give you some brief background. In Deception's Conquest mode, Apep is that young child at the beginning of the story who walks you, Shujinko, back and forth to Boracho's dojo before you continue to embark on the beginning of your quest, where you quickly meet Damashi, who takes you on your journey to collect the Kami Dogu, etc. Now, while Apep is introduced in the beginning quite prominently, he is literally never mentioned again. This was fine, and no one really talked about it, until Mortal Kombat X released where, within one of the towers, you play as Boracho who must avenge Apep's death, who we discover was murdered by Quan Chi. Whether or not the scene was removed from Deception, MKX, or elsewhere during the Mortal Kombat series is unclear. And this would explain why we do not see Apep again, despite his importance in the beginning of Deception's Conquest. It's sort of like what I was referring to in the Art Lean funeral scene where I'm giving this theory the benefit of the doubt given that there actually does seem to be a weird gap in the final film in the lack of closure on Art's death, similar to Apep disappearing completely in Deception. If you ask me, NRS saw opportunity here, and so I don't think this forbidden death scene is that out of the question. And as a final note, Apep is actually mentioned once again in Mortal Kombat 11. So he was mentioned in Mortal Kombat X in Boracha's character tower versus Quan Chi, but Apep was mentioned once again, who, if you didn't know it or not, is actually the main character you use while you navigate through the crypt in Mortal Kombat 11. This character's official name is the Descendant of Apep, who was actually murdered on Shang Tsung's island in Mortal Kombat 11's Aftermath story expansion. I guess it goes without saying that I had a lot of fun making this. So if you like this video and would like to see more in the vein of delving further into all of the lore Mortal Kombat has to offer, please push the like button and subscribe for future videos. It was my mission to ensure that no stone was left unturned in this iceberg. I didn't want to gloss over anything, 
And I do want to give a shout out to the creators of this iceberg. Hopefully they will reveal themselves someday and provide clarity on all manner of occult connections, Quan Chi killing kids, and all that weird stuff. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Flawless victory. And a string of failed attempts to transition from the small screen to the big screen left the troubled actor frustrated. The fans just couldn't adjust to the fact that Johnny was getting older. To them, he would always be that ass-kicking teen heartthrob from Power Rangers. This is the story of a faded star. This is the story of Johnny Cage.